Uh, like she said, my name is John Sego. I serve as the legislative director for Texas Right to Life. Uh, we have a, uh, a lot of programs, a lot of activities that our organization does that you've heard about uh, yesterday and today. Um, our department focuses on pro-life policies, whether that's through legislation or through rules. We have a five-member lobby team that focuses uh, on legislation and um, saving uh, innocent human lives through policies. Um, my department, we focus on the research, the writing, and the lobbying for pro-life policies. And uh, it's actually a very exciting time for our department right now because our legislative session just began uh, two weeks ago. And so here in the state capitol, our legislators gather every other year to pass legislation. Uh, and so we have a small window of 140 days to pass life-saving legislation that will protect uh, innocent human life from abortion and euthanasia. And so we're kind of uh, in our, our go time right now where we're working uh, a lot. We're trying to partner with other organizations, partner with other activists, uh, student groups. And so um, for, until the end of May, we would love to partner with you on passing pro-life legislation, making sure that Texas gets back into the place where we're leading the pro-life movement to save innocent human lives. Um, and uh, Texas has fallen behind, unfortunately. Uh, Texas at one point uh, was ranked the fourth most pro-life state in the country, and this year we're ranked the 20th most pro-life state in the country. Uh, unfortunately, and that's because of missed opportunities when our legislators uh, did not pass strong life-saving legislation. And so one of our jobs at Texas Right to Life is to encourage them to do that uh, kindly, nicely, sometimes a little boldly, more forcefully, but to encourage them not to miss opportunities to save innocent human life through legislation. The other aspects of education, uh, changing hearts and minds, that is critical. But legislation actually plays a part in that side of the movement as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a second. Now, what we've found whenever we've been lobbying for pro-life legislation is that a lot of our elected officials, they agree with us that abortion is wrong. They agree with us that we should protect pregnant women, we should protect preborn children from abortion, uh, but they really don't know what they're doing. They really don't know how to effectively do that. And so that is where uh, Texas Right to Life, we get to step in and we get to do the research. We get to do uh, the, the hard work to when we find a pro-life legislator who wants to be bold, we get to give him the language. We get to give him a bill and say, this is the most effective way to save lives in Texas. And so uh, it's, it's extremely uh, high privilege for us to be able to do this work, uh, for us to uh, this to be our job. It really is uh, a blessing. And one thing that we have found in doing this is that our legislators don't just need us to hand them language. They need us to hand them a strategy, a plan. A lot of our elected officials want to stop abortion, but they do not know how to do that. And so we focus on what, uh, how can we position our movement? How can we position our state for long-term success? And right now, that means overturning Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade is, has cast a shadow over our country since 1973. And our movement lives in that shadow, trying to save women today, trying to save preborn children today. But also, at Texas Right to Life, we believe we have to look forward and say, how are we actually going to get rid of this? How are we actually going to overturn Roe v. Wade so that we can protect innocent human life to the fullest extent. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, kind of what our uh, plan is, what, how we think the best approach is to overturn Roe v. Wade through state legislation. Now, our ultimate goal as a movement on the legislative side right now is to undermine, to weaken, and to reverse Roe v. Wade. But I want to be clear, it's not as if the battle is over. What's going to happen most likely is that Roe v. Wade will be diminished or overturned, and the question of abortion will be returned back to the states. And then we won't just have one big pro-life fight. We'll have at least 50 battlegrounds, 
50 fights. In some states, as we'll see, uh, we know where they'll go. We know where New York is going to go whenever they get to answer whether abortion is legal in their state or not. So I want to be clear that this is not, uh, the movement will not be over when Roe is overturned, but um, this is the first step, and we have to have a plan to do that. So first off, let's look at Roe v. Wade. Let's look at the major abortion jurisprudence following Roe. And so here we have a timeline of these are the major uh, lawsuits, the major Supreme Court rulings that shape abortion jurisprudence, that shape uh, what a court is going to look at if it, any judge it has a case before him saying, is this pro-life law allowed? It does this pro-life law go too far? These are the cases that, he's, uh, that they're going to look at. Now, I'm not uh, going to go into detail on all of them. Uh, you're welcome. I'm just going to summarize uh, some, and then if you're interested in going deeper, there's a lot of aspects to this topic. If you're interested in going deeper, you have a group that would be uniquely interested in uh, a more detailed talk on some of the specifics, uh, let us know. We would love to come talk to your pro-life group, to your Republican club, um, and uh, discuss overturning Roe a little bit more in detail. But I want to give you a basic framework this morning. So first, let's look at... Uh, Let's look at the first two rulings that came out in January of 1973. We have two cases that had the combined effect of keeping states from enforcing any ban on elective abortion. Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton were two uh, kind of paralleled cases that were considered together and ruled on in 1973. And what was kind of going on at this point is that several states had abortion bans already on the books in 1970 when this case started, when Roe v. Wade started. Several states had banned abortions, and then several states like New York had uh, legalized abortion. And in 1970, there was this new organized movement to repeal or to amend those pro-life laws that had been on the books for decades. <clears throat> and then we see that there were some ambitious lawyers that didn't just want to go lobby in capital, state capitals, trying to convince Texas to change their laws or to convince other states to change their laws, uh, like Georgia. They actually wanted to go uh, to the courthouse and look for test cases that they could sue in specific uh, states. And Texas was one of the targets. And that's where the case Roe v. Wade came from, is from some attorneys found a Texan named Norma McCorvey. And she was pregnant with her third child and decided that she didn't want to, uh, she didn't want to go through the pregnancy and she didn't want to have to suffer the, the hurt that she did of putting her child up for adoption after birth. And so these two attorneys, activist attorneys, argued in court, used this case as a, a test case, and argued in court that Texas's law banning abortion, except in cases when the mother's life or health was endangered, uh, was unconstitutional. They argued that by making it a crime to perform an abortion was unconstitutional and stepped onto the rights of this woman, uh, Norma McCorvey, who was looking for uh, an abortion. They argued that even though abortion is not mentioned in the Constitution, it's hidden in the Constitution. That there, the Ninth Amendment says there, there are several legal rights that the Constitution protects that are not numbered, that are not listed out explicitly. And so they argued the right to abortion is one of these. And they argued that uh, the Constitution protects citizens' right to life their right to liberty and property from unwarranted government intrusion without due process of law. And they argued that's what's happening when Texas bans abortions. Norma McCorvey wanted to make this very important decision about whether to have children or not, and Texas was saying, that's not fully your decision. Furthermore, they said Texas doesn't really have a compelling state interest to get involved in that question. That's a personal question. That's a private question. 
Texas has no business telling a woman whether she can have children or not. So they argued that a fetus has not been recognized in any law. Even the ban on abortion in Texas law didn't mention the fetus. It didn't say it was a person. It didn't say it should be protected uh, under any uh, amendments to the Constitution. It didn't even mention the fetus. It just said no abortion. And if you perform an abortion, that's a crime. So what we saw is that we saw that there was a 7-2 decision in the Supreme Court, and they ruled in favor of these activist lawyers. They ruled saying that the court uh, did believe that restricting abortion violates these kind of uh, unmentioned fundamental right to privacy, and that that was hidden inside the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Now, the right to privacy was not invented in this case. The right to privacy had been alluded to and used multiple times over and over again uh, to, to establish rights to uh, choosing who you marry, no matter their race, um, making decisions about procreation, having the right to contraception, uh, and other decisions. Kind of decisions that are uh, questions that were not named in the Constitution. Still, we had a right to these things hidden in this right to privacy. So the Supreme Court said, yes, this kind of bucket of rights called the right to privacy, we're putting abortion in that bucket as well. And they ruled that states have to balance the interest of the mother and interest of the potential life in the womb. Potential life. So they said the fetus is not mentioned in any law, it's not mentioned in the Constitution, but they did acknowledge there is potential life that some people in society want to protect. So what happened was they ruled that way, and they put in a trimester framework, kind of dividing that states have some rights later in pregnancy to protect uh, potential life later in pregnancy than before, and they created this idea of viability. And we'll come back to that in just a second. So they kind of created a framework for us to consider pro-life laws. Now, thankfully, McCorvey, this, law, uh, this lawsuit lasted for three years before it got a ruling from the Supreme Court. And so thankfully, Norma McCorvey had her baby during the lawsuit and uh, put her, her daughter up for adoption. Norma McCorvey later became a pro-life activist and speaker and a figure kind of revealing the truth about the activist behind her lawsuit and revealing the truth that she regrets her initial decision to seek an abortion. Even though she never had it, she realizes the, play, uh, the uh, position that she played in history uh, and became a very powerful voice for the pro-life movement. Now, the second case that goes with Roe is Doe versus Bolton. And Doe versus Bolton is usually overlooked, but it's very important because this was not from a state that had a ban on abortion. This was from Georgia. And they had an amended law that didn't ban abortions. It said you could still get an elective abortion as long as you have the permission of your doctor, had the consult of two other doctors, and got permission from a committee at the hospital. So there was a process you had to go through. And that committee, and that, those doctors in that committee, they were only allowed to give women permission to seek abortion under three circumstances. First, uh, if she was the victim of a sexual assault, they could authorize her to have an abortion. Second, if the, the, uh, the fetus had some kind of uh, injury, some kind of disability, some kind of deformity, then that was okay. The doctor could give permission to seek the abortion. And the third one was the health, uh, sorry, the, the physical life of the mother. That if the, the pregnancy was putting the life of the mother in jeopardy, then a doctor in the committee could give her permission to move forward. Now, when this case got up to the Supreme Court, they also ruled that these types of laws are unconstitutional. It's not a ban. It's actually saying you can still get the abortion. You just have to go through these steps. But the Supreme Court still said, no, 
that infringes upon your legal right to abortion. It makes it too difficult to practice that right. And that's a significant addition to just saying you can't ban abortion. Georgia said, no, we allow abortions in certain circumstances. And that court, it was very interesting because they looked at these exceptions and they tried to, to think about what is the purpose of this law. They asked, what is the motivation of Georgia to have this law on the books? And this was a deadly mistake. Is those exceptions proved to the court that this law was not about protecting life, it was about protecting the mother. This is fundamentally important, and it's going to be stuck with our court cases from now on, is that the court looked at it and said, well, obviously, Georgia doesn't think a fetus is a person because they allow that child to be killed if her mother was the victim of a sexual assault, if maybe the fetus has a disability. Those two exceptions really show the motivation of this law is not to protect life, it's to protect the mother, to make sure the mother, you know, if, if she had this trauma in her life, um, if she didn't want to have to care for a child with a disability. That was their logic. So they're looking at laws now, not just what the law says, they're looking past the law to see what the intent is. And that's critical because we actually see that they're trying to deduce if Georgia had a compelling state interest in that life and Georgia had put nothing in the record that said we care about the child just as much as we care about the woman. So both of these cases together were a deadly effect because now we have to be careful. Uh, they also expanded the definition of health. So now we can't just look at the physical health. States have to allow access to abortion for anything. You can see the definition there of health. It includes um, emotional, social, uh, it, it's very broad. And so the court is saying abortion is so important that uh, the mother may need it for social health purposes, which is up for interpretation. Um, and so essentially what these two rulings together did is say that states cannot block access to elective abortion all the way until the third trimester. If you do, you have to have this big loophole of a health exception. Now, after these rulings came out, the movement really was shocked. The, the, the signs of our culture were coming. Like I said, states, some states have been uh, allowing abortion, but still, this was uh, really a surprising event to have the, the effect of these two cases come out. And so what the pro-life movement did in those early days is they focused on a constitutional amendment. Okay, well, if the fetus isn't protected by the 14th Amendment uh, in word, let's change the words of the Constitution. Let's put preborn children in the Constitution. And so there was a lot of time and a lot of effort uh, put on that. Let's establish personhood. Let's clarify that children do have personhood legally. Remember, they, the court just called it potential life. Let's clarify the Constitution believes that it really is human life. <clears throat> and so you had that going on, and then you also had this discussion about funding. Okay, well, abortion is legal, but do we use taxpayer dollars for it? Okay, do we use Medicaid to pay for abortion? Do we use, um, uh, can states use, state, uh, can states ban using their taxpayer dollars for it? And so there was kind of these discussions until 1992. And until 19, around uh, the late eight, uh, 1980s, states started getting a little bit more bold on what protections they put in. And so states started passing other bills. Instead, not personhood, not focusing on funding, but putting in other just common sense protections for women. And so this case came out of that. Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992 <clears throat> was a Supreme Court ruling on Pennsylvania's law that had several protections on abortion access, or for women who were trying to access abortion. And so you can see the list there. <clears throat> they said, uh, before a woman can have an abortion, she has to give her informed consent, meaning that she has to read certain things, she has to hear certain things, she has to be educated about what an abortion is, what the nature of the, um, the child's development is. She has to wait for 24 hours before she can have an abortion to make sure that this is a well-thought-out decision. 
If the woman is a minor, she has to get consent from her parents. If she's married, she has to at least notify her spouse. States have to, uh, oh, sorry, abortionists have to report to the state how many abortions they're doing at what point in pregnancy. And then clarifying medical emergency, that uh, when abortion is allowed under a medical emergency exception, um, let's clarify what exactly that means and not leave it up to the Doe versus Bolton definition. And whenever this case went to the Supreme Court, the pro-life movement thought the game was over. They thought the Supreme Court would see how reasonable these protections are, that they would take a step back from Roe and Doe and say, you know what, let's let states craft their laws dealing with abortion. Okay, the Supreme Court looked promising, the numbers looked promising, and we believed that that was going to be it, that this, this question was going to be returned to the states. But Justice Kennedy <clears throat> was on the court at the time, and he became the key, uh, kind of key vote. And he actually wrote an opinion that affirmed the core holdings of Roe. He tried to have it both ways, saying, yes, Pennsylvania can put in some reasonable protections like this, but yes, Roe is still good law. Roe is still a good ruling, putting limits uh, or, or uh, protecting access to abortion. And he kind of reworked the foundation that Roe built, saying, trying to have it both ways. Yes, you can put in these types of laws, but Roe is still correct. And so essentially, what this was doing was saying, it was the Supreme Court telling pro-lifers to go home. Don't, don't try this again. Don't try to push the boundaries of what we've said already. Just accept this common mandate that's rooted in the Constitution. Remember, it's not in the Constitution, but it's rooted in the Constitution, is what they said. And so after, uh, so they also said that you can do all of those common sense policies, informed consent, 24-hour waiting period, parental consent, you can do those except for the spousal notification. That was the only one that they said crosses the line. That you don't have to, if you're married, you don't have to notify your spouse that you're having an abortion. And they created this very vague test by which, uh, which laws would work and which laws wouldn't by saying that we have to make sure these laws don't create an undue burden. You've heard that phrase before. Does this pro-life law create an undue burden on a woman's right to abortion? And it wasn't <laughs> very well defined, and it becomes something that we argue about in, in further cases. Um, but that's kind of where we were, is there was this kind of yellow light to the states. Okay, it's not a red, you don't have to, you know, it's not Roe v. Wade, but it's this yellow light of, okay, proceed with caution. Just don't create a burden. You can do informed consent, you can do parental involvement, you can do these other laws, uh, but be careful. Don't go too far, whatever that's supposed to mean. Um, so the pro-life movement kind of lives in this. Um, we create, we do things like women's right to know booklet. Um, we make sure that the state is publishing accurate and effective uh, educational material for women seeking abortion. We put in 24-hour waiting periods. Um, we, with the rise of um, ultrasound technology, we require that the woman, part of her informed consent package is that she sees an ultrasound of her child, hears the heartbeat of her child uh, before she has an abortion. All of these things. So we're kind of living in this space um, of not going on an undue burden. And then something kind of new happens in a debate around partial birth abortion. And so I'm going to skip Stenberg and go straight to Gonzalez uh, for those who are on the slides. Thanks. So now we have this new debate about partial birth abortion. And this is different because this is one particular uh, type of abortion, one particular method of abortion that is so uniquely horrific that the argument was there's a state interest in banning it. Not all abortions at any point in time, but this one type of abortion. President Bush, uh, President George W. Bush signed in 2003 the federal partial birth abortion ban. And he signed it into law, and it banned this abortion that when a child is partially born and then is killed with forceps to the back of the neck. And it was 
a game changer culturally because we actually had an open cultural conversation about how violent elective abortion is. And this changed hearts and minds as this legal debate was going on. When this case, uh, but the same arguments came. Okay, this is an undue burden. This is arbitrary. Uh, there may be health situations where doctors still need to use this particular method. That's what the opponent said. And that went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And guess who's still on the court? Justice Kennedy. And Justice Kennedy actually wrote this opinion, and he upheld the bill. He said, yes, that this is okay, that the federal government can do this and that states can pass this type of legislation on partial birth abortion. And he kind of gave three reasons. First, to protect the integrity of the medical profession. Some things are so horrific that the medical profession needs to be protected from these awful practices. Second, that states may want to ban this and the federal government should be able to ban this procedure to prevent the coarsening of society's moral sense. It's fancy for just saying, we don't want to be evil. <laughs> we don't want to, as a society, say, no, you can't stop this kind of violence against a newborn, right? All right. And then the last one is to allow states to protect fetal life. So now it's not potential life, it's fetal life. There is a fetus and it's alive and the states do have a growing interest in protecting that life. Whenever the procedures are so gruesome and inhumane, those are the words that he used, this procedure is so gruesome and inhumane that we're kind of breaking the mold from earlier court rulings. And we also see at this point uh, Justice Ginsburg uh, writing a dissent, uh, or writing an opinion here that is trying to kind of redo Roe, kind of go back and sturdy up the foundation, because she saw what was happening. We had this framework that states were supposed to play in. We had given them the, the yellow light of, you know, kind of come this way, don't go this far, but she saw what was happening. She saw that Justice Kennedy's ruling was actually opening up the floodgates. He was cracking the dam on what uh, the Supreme Court had said about undue burden, what they had said about the trimester framework and viability. And so she says, okay, hold on, hold on. We need to actually redo Roe and build it on uh, equality, social equality. We actually need to protect the right to abortion so that women uh, are equal in society with men. Because if I am up for a promotion, if, if me and one of my female colleagues is up for a promotion, and her resume has a, uh, a few months of uh, not working because she was expecting, and she uh, had a child and raised a child, and she wasn't working, her resume is going to have a gap. Well, my resume, since I'm a dude, doesn't have that gap, even if my family had children. And so whenever we're sitting in front of an employer who is looking who I'm going to hire, we're not equal. I have the advantage. And so she starts trying to put out these types of arguments that we have to protect abortion for other reasons, okay, not just the compelling state interest. She was trying to get away from that state interest of comparing the health of the mother to the life of the child. We have to come up with some other legal reasons, and she created these social equality arguments. And you'll still hear those a lot. Um, but that was never fully adopted by the court as the new foundation of Roe. We still have this cracked foundation of Roe v. Wade after Gonzalez versus Carhart. Okay. So fast forward from 2007 to 2013. Here in Texas, we passed a pro-life omnibus bill, one bill that had multiple policies in it. It had some regulations in it to protect the safety of the mother, it also had a 20-week ban. It had a, a law that, um, that banned elective abortions at 20 weeks because there is a medical consensus that at least by 20 weeks that preborn children can feel pain. Okay? So even though it was one bill, I want you to notice there are two different groups of policies. There's the groups of policies of making the abortion safer for the woman, making sure that the 
physician, who, uh, the abortionist who's performing the abortion, that he has the right training, he has the right credentials, making sure that the facility the abortion done is follows certain guidelines. That's all about the protecting the, the safety and the health of the mother. But banning abortions because children can feel pain is categorically different. It's like informed consent versus banning partial birth abortion. There's two different groups here. And in that one bill that we passed in 2013, both policies were in there. Well, Whole Women's Health, a chain of abortion clinics, challenged only the regulation side. They didn't challenge the pain part. They didn't challenge the policy that protected life because of its humanity and because, it, like you and me, it can feel pain. They're very, very strategic that they took the case on the health and safety of the woman. They took that up, and this was, uh, the case was heard in the Supreme Court right after Justice Scalia had passed away, and so there were only eight justices on the court, and we lost that case five to three because of this, because these regulations. And the court really went out of its way to criticize the state's effort uh, to the, kind of what the state was doing. And again, they're looking at the motives of the state and they said, you guys weren't looking at data, you weren't looking at the right medical journals, you weren't looking at, you didn't do any surveys to see if these regulations on abortion you tried to pass actually makes the abortion safer. And so they pretty much said, we don't trust state legislatures to pass legislation over here. We don't think that they're smart enough. We don't think they look at the right literature. They're not in the right circles to hear the right testimony to pass legislation that makes, that is focused on the health and safety of the woman. Well, Fast forward uh, four more years in 2020, and we see that the court has changed, is that now there is a pro-life majority, or what's expected to be a pro-life majority on the court. Well, Louisiana says, okay, it's my turn. I want to do some of those regulations that Texas did. This was a really odd move, but essentially it was like a redo. Let's try it again. How about now? And Unsurprisingly, the court said, no, we already sold you. You can't do these types of, even though there was better numbers on the court, they still said, no, we just ruled four years ago that this admitting privileges, talking about the credentials of the physician, that's not good policy. That doesn't fit these criteria that we've, we've drawn up. So that's where we are today, is after June Medical. Unfortunately, the Hellerstead in 2016 and June Medical in 2020 are kind of uh, detours to, what, uh, to where the movement should be going. And if you look at this next slide, I want to just emphasize uh, this main point. Keep going. It should be, okay. We've already talked about this. There are different types of laws. Um, some that are focused on the health and safety of the woman, some that are focused on uh, the, the child, the right to life of the child. And let's go to the next slide, there we go. This is the biggest takeaway, and this is critical to our strategy, is that there are two routes we can take. When you say, I want to pass pro-life legislation, there are two ways you can go. You can go with the health and safety of the mother, or you can go to protecting the child, the right to life of the child. And this is critical, remember, because the courts look at what your intention is. They look at what your motive is. And the court has said, we really don't trust you on that one road of protecting the health and safety because at the end of the day, we know you're just trying to stop abortions. We know these are these pro-lifers that are filing all of these. They're not, um, they're not trying to make abortion safer. They're trying to end abortion. That's what they argued. And so Texas Right to Life firmly believes that moving forward, the movement needs to focus on this other road emphasizing that our state has a compelling interest in protecting pre-born children. And that's why we're here. That's why we're passing legislation. So practically, that means things like bans on abortion, things like uh, bills that highlight the humanity of the child, like uh, banning abortions at the point whenever we know children feel pain, like prohibiting certain types of abortions that are so gruesome and inhumane. 
So that's why we passed the dismemberment abortion ban. Essentially, in 2017, what we were doing, Texas was doing, is saying, okay, Supreme Court, we have another abortion procedure like partial birth abortion. We have another procedure that is like that in that it is so gruesome and inhumane that a civilized society should ban them for the sake of our medical profession, for the sake of our moral uh, conscience. We should be able to ban dismemberment abortion, abortion that kills the child by removing its limbs when its heart is still beating. That sounds gruesome and inhumane to me. So that's a case that we currently have. We passed that in 2017, but these cases take a long time to get to the Supreme Court, and that's an important case that is actually uh, just, um, that is possibly on its way up to the Supreme Court. It's at the appeals level. But what I want to emphasize is that's the type of bill we want to focus on. That's the type of legislation that the movement needs to be unified on, is we need to stop talking about the abortionist, we need to stop talking about the clinic, Stop talking about these ways to protect the health and safety of the woman because that the reason we walked into this conference, the reason that we've dedicated ourselves to this movement is not so that abortion will be safer, but that abortion will be abolished. The reason we got involved in this movement is because elective abortion represents an act of injustice, a bigger, stronger party taking the life of a smaller, weaker party. That is why we're here. So let's pass legislation that lives up to those goals. Let's pass legislation that, uh, that reveals ugly practices like discrimination in the womb. Whenever a child is aborted just because they have a disability. We have disability protections in society, but when it comes to the womb, we allow for deadly discrimination to be legal. So we want to pass a piece of legislation that bans discriminatory abortions. If the abortion is motivated by the sex of the child, if uh, the, the abortion is motivated by the ethnicity of the child, or by a disability, that's something that we don't tolerate in regular society. Why do we tolerate it here whenever it's actually a life and death decision? So <clears throat> that emphasizes what our state interest is. Are, are why Texas cares about protecting preborn or passing these types of laws to protect preborn life. All right, I uh, forgot to take set my timer here. So, uh, Rachel, can I have some help? What time am I supposed to do questions? <clears throat> okay, thank you. Sorry about that. <clears throat> All right. Okay, well, let me jump ahead to the Venn diagram, Kim. So when Texas Right to Life looks at legislation, like we are right now in this legislature, uh, with the, the cap, uh, in this session, we look at these three questions, and we've been talking about the legal victories uh, circle, is that we have to find a bill that has all three of these qualities, one that leads to these uh, these legal and judicial victories. That's overturning Roe. That's passing dynamic legislation that's going to get in the court, that's going to raise the right questions, it's going to challenge the compelling interest argument, and it's going to show the viability um, that we should be able to protect lives no matter where they are in the pregnancy. We also ask, just very simply, does this bill save lives? There's a lot of pro-life bills that are filed that don't actually save lives. Okay, they're either regulating an industry or they're actually just flag waving. There's plenty of legislation that is filed that says it all, the only reason it was filed was for your senator or your representative to remind you they're pro-life and you should vote for them again, right? So we ask, does this bill save lives? Does this bill help us get to overturning Roe to continue to crack that legal foundation of Roe v. Wade? And then the last question is, does this bill uh, move the cultural conversation forward. Remember how partial birth abortion, talking about that, when that bill was passed, talking about what partial birth abortion was, talking about what dismemberment abortion is, that actually shapes our cultural conversation. When you post on Facebook about this bill that was filed, this pro-life bill, you're immediately going to have a cultural conversation in the comments section. Right? Your Bible study, uh, your friend from Bible study is going to jump on there and say, This is great. We need to protect all lives. And then your friend uh, from college is going to jump on there and say, This is a terrible bill. I can't believe you hate women. 
right? This, that, that nice way to talk about that is it's a cultural conversation. So, but with the bills that we pass, we kind of shape that cultural conversation. Whenever we talk about why we should ban abortions at 20 weeks, we get to talk about the child who feels pain like you and I do. That, that uh, science shows us that they release the same chemical stress, uh, this, the stress chemicals that we do whenever you have a pop quiz set down in front of you in class. Those same chemical reaction your body has to that, it's the same chemical reaction that happens in the fetus whenever a loud noise is made outside the womb, right? We see that the way that you react to pain in a whole body reflex is the same way they react to pain when their whole body reacts to a localized pain. There's the scientific evidence we get to talk to our neighbors about whenever we focus on the right things. But consider another bill. Consider a bill, uh, consider a bill that says pregnant women can use the HOV lane. Right? So in the city, on the highways, there's one lane designated for carpools, the carpool lane. Right? Well, if you're a single person in the car, you're not supposed to use that lane. Well, what if there's a bill filed that says, okay, pregnant women can use that lane now? Okay? Cultural conversation? Yeah, we get to say, actually, if a pregnant woman gets in a car, she's automatically a carpool. There are two people in that car, okay? So we get to kind of reiterate the personhood of the child, okay? Is that bill going to be used to overturn Roe v. Wade? Probably not. Uh, it'd be a stretch to argue this is actually a personhood bill. But then that last one, is this going to save lives? It's a good policy. It's a pro-life policy. It has a pro-life premise in it. But is it going to save lives? Well, traffic on I-35 in Austin is bad, but I doubt a woman would be stuck in traffic and think, you know what? I'm going to save the life of my pre-born child so that I can use that carpool lane. Traffic gets, does get bad pretty time, but at times, but I doubt that this bill would save lives, even though it's a pro-life bill. And so that's what we do with every bill that is filed. <clears throat> right now, our team is reviewing uh, over 500 bills that have been filed this session already. And they're asking these questions. If it's a pro-life bill, does it save lives? Does it move the cultural conversation in the right direction? And ultimately, what we've been talking about this morning mostly is will it lead to future victory in court, where we overturn Roe v. Wade. This session, we're working on a bill called the Texas Abolition Strategy. You can pick up a one-pager at our table, the legislative table in the back, uh, about it. And it's an omnibus bill, uh, like we talked about. It's one bill that has multiple policies in it. And it strategically lays out when these policies should go into effect so we can get these right court cases up to the Supreme Court to undermine Roe and to protect all innocent preborn life in Texas. If you're interested in this, if you're interested in promoting pro-life legislation this session, sign up for our text alerts. You can find the information at the table. Come by and take uh, a summary of our agenda. We need your voice to pass pro-life legislation. There's going to be a lot of bills filed that claim to be pro-life, and we need your help to help our legislators focus on which bills are actually going to save lives, get the right kind of lawsuits in court, and emphasize our strong, compelling state interests in protecting all innocent human life. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. I uh, got some questions here for you here, and uh, continue submitting your own questions through the Boots on the Ground app, please. Um, what are your thoughts on trigger bans, and can you explain a little bit about what a trigger ban is? Excellent. <clears throat> so one category of pro-life bills uh, and laws that we've seen is something called a trigger ban, and it says we're going to ban all elective abortions. We're going to uh, we're going to ban all elective abortions whenever the Supreme Court overturns Roe. Okay, so. This is not a bad idea. This is not a bad policy. We want to be prepared for that moment when Roe v. Wade is overturned. The problem is, essentially, what this says is we're not going to send the cases up to challenge Roe. We're just going to sit on the sidelines and hope some other state does it. And I think that's a huge missed opportunity, especially when in Texas we're in a great circuit court. We have a great attorney general's office that argues these, uh, and we have 
pro-life majorities in both chambers. We can do more than just take a back seat to the pro-life movement and hoping that, that Roe will be overturned. Um, so a trigger ban is, again, it's these good versus best idea. Is, is it a good policy? Yeah, it, it may be good. Um, there's some legal complications and who gets to decide what Supreme Court does. Remember Casey, um, the pro-life movement thought the Supreme Court was gonna overturn Roe and they actually said, yes, you can do some pro-life things, but we're upholding Roe. That's usually what the Supreme Court does, is they usually don't just say, I'm sorry guys, we were wrong, and uh, we repent, please forgive us. We're gonna, they don't do that. And so whenever Roe is overturned, it might be nuanced like that. Um, and so the question with trigger bills is who gets to be interpreting what they did and whether it triggers this ban. Uh, so we would prefer fighting, putting bold legislation to overturn Roe, uh, and then you know, coming back and getting the strongest law that we can pass when it is officially over. Um, another strategy that some pro-lifers will discuss is to ignore Roe and to just ban abortion outright, ignore the Supreme Court. Can Excellent. you discuss that strategy? Yeah, this is another, so in the pro-life movement, this is another one where there's, other, there's different views on this. There are some in our movement, some friends of ours, who believe, uh, pretty much they believe you just wasted an hour of your time listening to all of this. Uh, and you may think that too, but just bear with me. Um, they believe that instead of putting cases up in the Supreme Court to undermine Roe, we need to just say, you know what, we don't like Roe, we don't think you had the constitutional authority to rule that way, uh, and so we're just gonna act like Roe doesn't exist. And so we're gonna ban abortions tomorrow, and then whenever the, Supreme, whenever the case gets filed in federal court, we'll just ignore it. And we'll just reiterate, Texas has a right to do this, and we're not gonna listen to any federal courts. Okay? It sounds like a, a, a bold stand, but it's not a winning strategy. Because of the way that our judicial system works, the way that our executive uh, branch in <clears throat> Texas and in our states work, that is not actually gonna save any lives. If we thought that would save lives, we would be leading the charge on it. We would be right here telling you, let's do that. Um, it's called nullification, and, and it's not, it has not proven to be a successful strategy. And so, um, do I think the Supreme Court doesn't, should not have this authority? Absolutely. Do I think Roe was wrongly decided? Absolutely. Do I think that idea of ignoring Roe will actually protect lives in Texas? No, I don't. Um, we have a chessboard set in front of us, and we might, not, we might not like the circumstances, but it is the game we have to play, and this cause is too important for us to be wishing the board looked differently. No, we're called to be faithful in fighting the best we can with the circumstances we're in. And so uh, we don't believe nullification is, a, is the right strategy. We have friends who believe that, who are working on bills like that in the legislature. Um, they're not the enemy. Uh, they still are in the pro-life movement. We still are friends with them. We still believe abortion is unjust. We have a difference on the right strategy. And so it's kind of like a family conversation of what is the best way to end this injustice. Can you give a little bit more clarification on the difference between the 2017 bill that's in the courts, dismemberment, and um, SB 1033 from 2019? Yeah, <clears throat> excellent. So um, the court right now, there's a case um, on the dismemberment abortion ban, and they had a hearing last week. Uh, the case is moving up, and this bans one type of abortion procedure, a, dis uh, a dismemberment abortion, where the child is killed by taking their limbs, uh, pulling their limbs off while the child's heart is still beating. It's a gruesome, inhumane, it's, it's a horrific, torturous procedure. And so what we did in 2017 is we banned that type of abortion. Um, and for the cultural reasons, to try to, uh, because it's done earlier in pregnancy, it was a strategic way to show the court, you should give Texas the right to protect life even at 15 weeks if these, you know, if things are so bad, so unethical, so gruesome. And again, we're trying to chip at that foundation. This is not the end all. This is chipping that foundation for Roe to fall. And so that was the dismemberment abortion ban, which is up in the court right now. We're hoping that gets to the Supreme Court. It's a fantastic piece of legislation to be argued before the Supreme Court. Um, what we're working on last session and this session is the Pre-Born Non-Discrimination Act, Senate Bill uh, 1033 last session. Uh, the Pre-Born Non-Discrimination Act 
bans discriminatory abortions, if the abortion is motivated by discrimination because of their gender, um, like the dad you know, is forcing his wife to have an abortion because they found out it was a girl instead of a boy, uh, because of the race of the child. If it's a minor who's expecting and the dad is racist and says, your boyfriend is black and I want you to have this abortion, that would be banned. And then also uh, protecting children from uh, discrimination because of a disability. If a doctor says, we think the child may have Down syndrome or the child may have this specific disability uh, or this specific condition, um, um, abortion motivated by that would be discriminatory and those would be banned. And the whole reason is to get to the court to say, see court, there are more complex situations, you should let us ban abortions. What you're doing, talking about undue burden, what you're doing about saying only after viability, that doesn't work. There are many other angles of why you should let states have more authority on which abortions we ban. That's really the purpose of, of this, is we have a compelling state interest and we're just giving you examples of these different angles of why the jurisprudence that we've talked about is erroneous. Um, so those are the two different, two different bills. What are, excuse me, what are some ways that the people here in the audience and watching at home can um, help to pass good pro-life legislation and um, can they even shadow you and see what you and your team does in the Capitol? Yeah, so back on the legislative table, uh, we have a list of events. We already have some dates scheduled for this session when we're having a student lobby day, uh, we're having a young adult lobby day, and then we're having just a anybody and everybody lobby day. Um, and those are really critical because those are when you get to come to the Capitol, um, you get to go talk to your elected official and tell them, yes, I care about public health and COVID. Yes, I care about passing a good budget, but I also voted for you. The reason I voted for you, Representative, is because I'm pro-life and you said you were too. And so this session, I need you to pass strong pro-life legislation. You get to go tell them that in person. Now you can send them emails, you can call them, you can tweet at them. Uh, those are important things, but being there in person is the most uh, powerful way. And so we have some lobby days set up for that. Um, also, if you sign up for our text alerts, you'll get the uh, up-to-minute updates, but also calls to action. Whenever we have a bill filed and uh, we're trying to get people to sign on to it, we'll send an update, say, hey, click here and send your legislator an email uh, asking them to sign on to this bill. And that's critical for getting momentum on this legislation. So if you're on our text alerts, if you plan to come to our lobby days, those are the, the best opportunities to make a difference. What are some of the biggest obstacles to passing pro-life legislation in a state like Texas? Yeah, so Texas, uh, we have the reputation of being very conservative. We have a reputation of being very pro-life. But like I said earlier, when a national group looked at all the states and their state laws protecting life, they ranked Texas as the 20th most pro-life state. And that's because we've missed these opportunities. We have a big ego, we have a big swagger that we're the most pro, you know, ba biggest, baddest pro-life state around, but it's just not reality. When you look at the loopholes that we have in our law, when you look at how we treat vulnerable patients in Texas, um, when you look at these missed opportunities to save lives, we're not actually living up to our ideals. And so the biggest hurdle uh, are Republicans. I mean, the biggest hurdle is the Republican Party of Texas that has historically given a pass to these uh, pro-life bills that don't live up to the standards we talked about. And so that is a huge hurdle for us, is Republicans control both chambers, they control the uh, governor's mansion. Um, Republicans run the state right now, and so any failure under Republican leadership, you, you, that's, you can't blame the Democrats, the minority party. Um, you have to blame Republicans for not getting their priorities straight. Now, thankfully, we have some changes in the Republican Party of Texas that they are working extremely hard to pass legislative priorities that set, uh, that, that set life at the top of the list. Um, that's a very great development from the official party, but that hasn't, uh, that hasn't migrated from the party to all the elected officials yet. We're still having to encourage them. We're still having to kind of fight for space in the agenda that our legislators are gonna pass this session. And so that's the biggest hurdle, is that's why you, if you voted Republican, you're, it's very important that you say, or if you're represented by a Republican, that you say, hey, you campaigned as pro-life. You convinced me to vote for you because of this. Let's see it. Uh, and, and that's why it's really important to hold our um, majority party accountable. 
Uh, I think this is the last question we have time for. Um, what happens when a pregnant woman is murdered, and does the law recognize that two persons were murdered? Yeah, so there was some legislation passed in Texas that does recognize the child as a second victim in uh, cases of assault and cases of homicide. Um, and so you, you, you know, sometimes we see these stories pop up on the news of when there's a drunk driver um, that kills a pregnant woman and her child. There's actually two accounts um, there, uh, two victims recognized by law there. And it's just one of these areas in our law where we've been able to make progress on this, but it just shows kind of the double-mindedness of our legal system, uh, is that we're acknowledging if the child was wanted, it's not just potential life, it's real human life. But if that woman was on her way to an abortion clinic and didn't get an accident and got to the abortion clinic safely, uh, the law looks the other way. And uh, so it's a tragic um, it's a tragic hypocrisy in our law, but we are thankful that there are little areas in our law that kind of the, that show the truth, is that um, a child is uh, a moral agent, the child is an uh, innocent human being that deserves our moral and legal protection. Um, and so that is one of the areas that our law does that. I do actually, this is, should be a very short question. Is there a way to access your slides or to um, access the information that you shared on your yeah, slides yeah, today? Yeah, absolutely. Come give me your email address and I'll, I'll send you all the resources. Thanks okay. so much, Thank John. You.